Hey everyone, welcome, welcome. It's good to see everybody. So welcome to Honest, Equitable and Accessible, Investing in Tomorrow. We've had long standing issues with access to capital in our region since forever, coupled with glaring and known issues of access to capital for female founders and founders of color all across the nation, which obviously have had a, has had a compounding effect here because capital is generally scarce. There's also issues with imbalances with who's making the investing decision and who's getting access to the highest quality investment opportunities. But it doesn't have to be this way. It can be changed and it is changing with the help of our panelists today. Today's panel will explore the possibilities that innovative and forward thinking leadership in this space will create for growth minded Louisiana entrepreneurs of all backgrounds. So let me first introduce our moderator for today, Bill Ellison, and he'll introduce our panelists. Bill Ellison is a serial entrepreneur, attorney, and private investor. He is also an active board member for several companies. Bill was in private practice for 20 years before pivoting to the entrepreneurial world in 2000, when he became an investor, the general counsel, and director of an HIT startup company. Bill subsequently became the president and CEO of the publicly traded company, which was sold in 2012. He subsequently started, operated, and invested in several startup companies. Bill is the CEO of Innovation Catalyst Incorporated, a nonprofit venture development organization whose mission is to accelerate the growth of early stage innovative businesses into venture ready companies by providing capital connections and coaching. He's also the CEO of the Red Stick Angel Network, a wholly owned subsidiary of Innovation Catalyst Inc, whose members are Baton Rouge based angels, meaning accredited investors who are interested in investing in um, small and startup growing businesses who work together to identify, vet, fund and grow early stage companies based in Louisiana. Bill graduated from the University of Mississippi with a BA in 1982 and a JD in 1986. Bill is also my colleague here. We, he works very closely with the staff of Nexus Louisiana, helping to advise the companies that are our clients or those that we're serving in our, in our investment readiness program and helping to connect them with capital. Bill, thank you so much for agreeing to moderate today. And now over to you. All right, well, thank you, Wendy, for that introduction. Um, again, my name is Bill Ellison. And as, as Wendy was, was saying, uh, today's discussion, we're going to focus on one aspect of the future in, of investing and the future of investing capital, um, of, of raising capital and investing capital. Uh, more specifically, what individuals and organizations such as these people on our panel are doing now um, to make the investing landscape more accessible, more diverse, and more equitable. Uh, I'm very looking. I'm very much looking forward to hearing what the panel say. I think it's going to be very illuminating. Uh, I think each of their uh, complete bios are um, on their picture below our, our screen. But I first kind of wanted each of them to in quickly introduce themselves. Um, Lenny, you're right there. You want to start off? Sure. I am uh, Lenny Cezanne, and I am a co-founder and managing director of Urban Capital Network. I uh, started my career as an electrical engineer. Uh, I actually graduated uh, from LSU with an electrical engineering degree. Um, I later on, got an MBA from Tulane. So um, I have Louisiana roots and connections. I no longer live there anymore. I moved to Houston in 2005 after uh, Hurricane Katrina. Um, and uh, since, since I've uh, kind of transitioned from electrical engineering to, uh, to this venture space, um, uh, it kind of what preempted that was just, you know, my career path was constantly evolving and, and kind of gotten out of my control. So I, I moved in, uh, moved along from uh, the technical side to the financial side. Uh, and I also work as a business broker uh, where I help business owners sell their businesses and I work with buyers who are looking to buy businesses, which kind of opened the doors for me to get involved in uh, angel investing and veteran investing uh, in working with buyers. All right, well, thank you, Lenny. Why don't we just kind of go clockwise, uh, Carlton? Hey, everyone. My name is Charlton Cunningham. 
I serve as the ecosystem programs manager at HBC VC, um, which is a nonprofit that is focused on bringing more uh, racial and ethnic diversity to the venture capital space. Um, prior to that, um, I spent uh, time as the executive director of an organization called Startup Atlanta. I'm Atlanta based, don't hold that against me, Saints fans. Um, and my whole goal is to connect and grow the, the overall startup ecosystem. So um, over the course of uh, the last decade, I've spent a lot of time in entrepreneurial support roles um, and, and now with HBCU VC really focused on um, creating the next generation of, of VCs um, and starting and looking at HBCUs and other overlooked uh, regions. So really excited to be a part of this conversation. Uh, fantastic, uh, thank you. Kim? Hi everybody, I'm Kim Seals. I'm a general partner in the Jump Fund. We are a micro VC fund uh, headquartered out of Tennessee, but I'm our Atlanta-based partner. I am also a Baton Rouge native, a graduate of LSU, got my degree in psychology back in the 80s and uh, stuck around Baton Rouge for a little while uh, post-graduation to have a couple of uh, corporate roles in human resources by background, but left uh, Baton Rouge and, and moved to Atlanta for a career move and then became uh, interested in angel investing and then uh, worked with uh, some colleagues I met as an angel investor to start up a fund back in uh, you know 2012, I believe it was. In addition, uh, so our role at the Jump Fund, just to give you a bit of background on the Jump Fund, is we invest in women-led startups that are headquartered in the Southeast. So um, in both, across both of our funds, we've invested in a close to 30 companies uh, that uh, have at least one woman in the C-suite with equity in the company on par with the men in, in, in the company. Uh, one of our Louisiana investments is Resilia. I know everybody heard from Savitri Wilson yesterday, so uh, certainly a proud investor in, in uh, Savitri and her team and everything they've accomplished there with Resilia. In addition to my role as a general partner in the Jump Fund, I'm also a venture partner with Outlander Labs which is one of the most recent uh, venture capital funds that has uh, sprung up here in the Southeast, focused on uh, early stage startups. Uh, and we took a different approach in that rather than put, um, you know, put some parameters around the founders, we actually set out with a mission to make sure that all of our check writers were diverse and that we'd have a diverse pool of check writers of people of color or women who are writing the checks into the founding team. So we can talk about more about that and sort of what we've seen in terms of what that did to our pipeline later, Bill, when we get into the Q&A part. Okay, thank you, thank you, Kim. Uh, Cliff? Hi, everybody. My name is Cliff Holkamp. I'm the co-founder and managing director of Cultivation Capital. We are an early stage venture capital firm uh, headquartered in St. Louis. I actually work in South Carolina in Greenville. And we, um, uh, since our founding in 2012, it had a focus on undercapitalized markets. And we are driven by the mission of creating, uh, trying to, to tighten the gap between the Midwest and the Southeast and what we see in the Northeast and the, and the West Coast when it comes to venture capital funding. We strongly believe that having a strong entrepreneurial ecosystem is critical for overall economic development and economic health. And so we were uh, driven by that passion of trying to uh, build uh, uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems in uh, where we live. Um, in a prior life, I uh, uh, was an entrepreneur, uh, having founded a chain of healthcare centers, uh, which I sold in 2007. And in 2019, I retired from the faculty at Washington University in St. Louis, where I was also the director of our entrepreneurship program. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Okay, thank you, everyone. I think, um, I think we have enough talent here to answer all the questions that we're gonna talk about today. So this panel is to talk about the future of the investing landscape, but let, let's kind of pause a second and first talk about what, what are the current problems of today with you know, certain uh, people of the population having access to capital and then certain people having access to investable deals. Who would like to kick off and start articulating some of the issues? Um, I'll, I'll start off um, and, right. and I'll tell you guys and an audience a little bit more about Urban Capital Network. Um, so th there's always been um, a recognition that, you know, there's a, there's a lack 
of diversity in the VC ecosystem. And most of that uh, attention has been focused on the distribution of capital and the fact that uh, minority entrepreneurs do not get access to those um, um, investment um, funding opportunities from VCs. So um, what we do at Urban Capital Network, we recognize that as well, but we also recognize the other side of the coin that uh, minority investors aren't getting access to VC backed deals as well. So um, when you look at why minorities might not be getting access to funding. Well, I don't think it's always intentional. Um, a lot of it just has to do with the, 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 the environment that they operate in, the, the network that they have available to them. And many of them do not have access to the angel uh, friends and family to uh, help them create an MVP, a minimum viable product and help them become VC ready. Um, so that, that's an issue. Um, so what, what we do at Urban Capital Network is we kind of attack the other side of the coin and ultimately we want to help um, uh, create capital that will circulate through the minority communities. And the way we do that is we partner with VCs who value uh, our platform in bringing diversity into their LP base. And what we're doing is um, we focus on minority investors, um, although we don't exclude anyone. And um, that may be, they, these investors may be at the, the lower tier of accredited investors. Uh, typically, the minimum investment in a VC fund you might find $250,000 is maybe the lowest, but most of them are 1 million to 5 million, right? So what we do is uh, we, we make investments more affordable for these lower tier accredited investors. Um, we, by, by partnering with the VCs and getting access to their portfolios, we're diversifying their investment. And because they're VC backed, we're de-risking the investment as well. And our hopes is that uh, once these investors get access to these opportunities and they start generating uh, returns and realizing gains on those returns, that they can then be, become angel investors and invest in earlier stage deals where they have a little bit more uh, uh, capital to risk. Right now, these are mostly first time uh, early stage investors. And like I mentioned, they're lower tiered uh, accredited investors, so they don't have a lot of capital to to diversify their investments. They may only have twenty five thousand um, dollars. So you know, everyone knows that you know, you, nine out of uh, out of ten of your angel stage uh, investment opportunities are probably not going to generate much of return, if any at all. And you that one may compensate for. Uh, the losses on the others. But when you don't have enough capital to spread it around, you need an opportunity to be able to diversify your investment. And that's what we do at Urban Capital Network um, in, in giving investors the opportunity and in hopes that they will uh, gain some returns, un learn the process and eventually uh, invest upstream. And what we also do to, to kind of complete the cycle and, and, and set an example of what we hope to happen. We take a portion of our management fees um, from putting together these deals and we invest in those earlier stage deals ourselves. So we take on the risk um, right now and we're not asking our investors to take on that risk yet. So, okay. um, you know, I think what Lenny's doing is great. And you know, what I want to add to that is this is such a complex problem that there's so many different reasons why uh, we have not been able to make any real meaningful progress on this situation, either to get more capital in the hands of underrepresented founders and to move the needle on the diversity in the check writing teams. Um, and one of the other things I want to point out is the uh, is that the founders, the diverse founders, 
and the problems they're solving, a lot of times we find that people start businesses to solve problems they're personally passionate about solving, right? And so then when they go look for funding, and it's a problem maybe that affects the black community or a problem that affects the female community. And then they go approach uh, people who write checks to try to get them to invest in the business. And what the people that are going to write the checks are not in that community that's being targeted to solve the problem. And they don't understand the problem that's being solved. And then they don't have an interest in it or they don't get excited about it or they maybe don't see the potential market opportunity. So then they pass on investing in that deal because it, it just doesn't speak to them, right? And so, uh, so, so that's one of the reasons why we have to get more people, more diverse people writing checks, a more diverse group of people writing checks uh, so that we can get more great companies founded or funded uh, because uh, you know, they understand the idea and they understand the market potential and, and opportunity there, right? So that's, uh, that's another part of the problem as well. And when we started the Jump Fund back in 2012, we were having a very difficult time finding women on the stage at pitch competition. So that's what sort of spurred it for us. We were like, where are the women? Why aren't they on the stage? And we'd ask the guys that were running the pitch competitions. They were like, well, they don't apply to get on the pitch competition stage. They must not be there. And you know, we know it's not a pipeline problem. There are women out there starting companies and they're starting companies in much higher numbers than men are right now. And in fact, women of color are starting companies in even higher numbers than, than white women are. So where are they? Why aren't they on the stage? And so we wanted to bust two myths. We wanted to bust the myth that there weren't women starting companies. And we also wanted to bust the myth that women were not willing to invest in this asset class because it's too risky. So the point Lenny was making, which is, you know, we know how many, um, you know, how many startups actually fail, right? And you have to go into this knowing there's a big chance you could lose your money if you invest in startups. So, uh, so we, when we raised Jump Fund One, we targeted getting women investors. Uh, so our fund is run entirely by women and 90% of our LPs are women. And we really wanted to show that women would invest in other women and, uh, and that we would you know, put that focus on that lens. And we have a lot of women of color uh, that are that we have funded, uh, and again, looking to bring a, a focus on the the business problems they're solving with the solutions that they're bringing to the table. So you know, it's such a it's just such a multi lens problem around uh, around this that uh, if it were easy to solve, it would have been solved by now. But right. so many different factors, and and I think each of us is sort of bringing a different idea in terms of how we're all tackling it. But let me ask you a quick follow-on question, kind of going back to, you know, what the problem with access to capital, obviously, if you're an entrepreneur trying to grow a company, you know, you got to have your friends and family follow on investment, uh, you know, continual source of capital. Uh, you know, when you kind of touched on some of the problems, you know, part of the community is lack of network, they're not in the right environment. And, you know, I think a big one, they don't have access to, um, you know, friends and families who understand this, number one, and or who could you know, help fund them to get them going to the next stage. Uh, can you guys kind of touch base on kind of the problems with access to capital and amplifying what Lenny talked about? And what are some of the other issues with access to capital by certain groups? I can certainly uh, pipe in there and talk about some national statistics as well. They just came out with the numbers for 2020 and venture capital investing, even with a, a, a little bit of a downturn during COVID uh, when it first came out, were actually up in 2020. Uh, but the number of deals funded was actually down. So there's a very interesting phenomenon that's been happening for the last few years where, where venture funding is giving a larger amount of money to smaller number of entrepreneurs. And of course, that doesn't benefit uh, macro sense what we're all trying to do, right? And so um, really, I think a lot of the answers to that are the types of programs you're hearing now where uh, it's approached at the local level. And um, there was a study at Kaufman way back in 2012 that, that still holds true. And that's that 80% that of angel investment is made within 20 miles of the angel's house. So this really is a local community problem and it needs to have local solutions because um, the, the, that on the high end, on the big dollars, you know, they need more mature companies to be able to put these bigger dollars into. 
So I see as part of our mission, I know everybody else in this panel's mission as well, is to seed and grow more early stage companies from a local and regional perspective so that the national and international firms can afford to put a check into them because they got to get it to a pretty big stage through our ecosystems before they can get those growing, you know, uh, uh, coastal checks. Exactly. Charlton, you want to chime in? Yeah, I mean, one thing that I, I will mention um, is that the racial wealth gap is a, is a thing that exists. And when you talk about, you know, friends, family, and fools, um, <laughs> if, there's a, is a, if there's a disparity in the folks who have that wealth to be able to invest, um, then you'll see that those funding gap issues that we have. And uh, to Kim's uh, point, um, there needs to be more diversity in the, in the investing team, the people who can write checks. Um, I think another, another thing that we are trying to combat in the work that we do is this idea of um, pattern matching, right? Um, people are looking for Mark Zuckerberg, looking for a white guy in a hoodie from uh, you know, Ivy League college. Um, and how do you open up your mind to what an entrepreneur can be? And that same thing exists in you know, VC. I believe the last stat was 40% of uh, investors come from Stanford or Harvard. Um, and so we're trying to attack that problem and, and really, you know, part of it is an awareness part problem. Um, a lot of the students that we work with at HPCUs are looking at finance or looking at consulting. I look at, you know, these traditional careers because of the stability of it. Um, you know, entrepreneurship, innovation is a, a risky thing, a risk taking. Um, and part of, you know, what we do is teaching them that it's okay to fail <laughs> um, and that, you know, the idea that you can fail, you can get up and you can try again. Um, a lot of times the students aren't, they're looking to, to get in these careers that um, are able to, you know, give them a, a steady income. They might be supporting their family. And so um, just the work that we're doing is exposing them at, the, at a young age, teaching them about VC as a career path. Maybe they'll get to it. You know, they, they might go work at a startup, start their own startup, work in finance. But we really want them to look at VC as a way to come back and um, be a part of that ecosystem so that they can start to seed um, the friends from their schools um, and other entrepreneurs that might be getting overlooked. Yeah, and if I could add something, Bill, if I could just add something there. You know, I've been doing a lot of education sessions these days with um, women of color entrepreneurs. There's a lot of... Uh, a conversation going on right now about ways that they can fund the early stage money they need before they they can even take on angels and um, early VC money and talking about grants that are available and talking about um, you know where they SBA loans and, and there's a lot of programs right now that are coming out of this post COVID and I guess maybe post COVID is a little too early to say those words I'm hopeful but you know all the money that's flowing right now that's that's targeting small businesses. And working with them on ways they can get um, non-dilutive funding for their businesses in this time right now, knowing that friends, family are not an option, and uh, and we don't want them to get too much into personal debt. Uh, so, um, you know, just having that conversation about creative ways to finance your business in the early days when you're still trying to get those paying customers, but also being very intentional with found, with founders entrepreneurs to say the best way to fund your business is a paying customer. And, you know, how can we help you not forget that, that, you know, the end all be all is not to find people like us to take equity in your company. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of perfectly good businesses out there that are, are very successful bootstrapping for some period of time. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes we forget to say that on panels that, um, you know, that, that, that there are other ways you can get money uh, that, that uh, don't involve uh, investors. Well, well, let's kind of delve into that. You know, we, we've articulated the problem and, uh, you know, Kim, you and Charlton have kind of touched on some of what your organizations are doing to combat that issue, those issues. Uh, well, let's kind of get into the weeds. Like, what are y'all's organizations doing specifically in order to address these problems? And the next question, is it working? Um, um, CBD, if it's working, I mean, in, in my opinion, but... Well, let's hold off on the is it working question. Let's answer the first one. <laughs> well, I, I can give you a roadmap for Urban Capital Network. Uh, you know, we're, we're not there yet, but uh, our roadmap 
does include a, a nonprofit that we have started um, and we're kind of building the programming around that right now where uh, we're looking to help the entrepreneurs who are not quite ready uh, for uh, investments yet, just to kind of get them there, to, to train them to, and to provide resources to them to, to help them understand uh, their business model if they don't really have it uh, fine-tuned just yet. And uh, we're leveraging our network uh, uh, for advisors to, to help them, um, um, to, coach, to coach them along as well. And, and we're also um, in contact and talks with, with corporate VC um, funds that are interested in participating and funding some of this as well. So that's just a roadmap that we have. Um, so I can't speak on whether or not it's working or not, but that's what we plan on doing to, to kind of um, you know, cultivate the, those, those entrepreneurs that like Kim just mentioned, you know, they, they need to understand how to, to generate revenue, how to uh, take their idea and, and, and make it an MVP. I'll jump in. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Charles. Go ahead. Uh, so I'll, I just wanted to jump in and talk about kind of the work we do. What does it look like? Um, so we have our core programming is a fellowship program. We work directly with HBCU students um, during the kind of the school year. Uh, we teach them VC curriculum, due diligence, cap tables, VC technicals, connect them to VC mentors, and then provide opportunities in the summer. And so we are in class four right now. Um, and so you talk about, you know, what is, have we been doing? What have we been doing? Has it worked? Um, from our class one, we have um, uh, an individual who's working in capital formation at Launch Tennessee. Um, recently, we had someone who got um, an investing role at um, SoftBank's Opportunity Fund. And so we're starting to see some of the seeds from the earlier classes um, get in these investing roles. Our goal is for them to become, you know, check writers. Um, but from that early work that we've been doing with, um, with the institutions, we've also partnered with place-based cities um, to kind of take our curriculum and our approach um, to teaching. And so we've actually partnered with Annenberg Foundation in LA um, to create the Pledge LA um, internship program that's focused on basically creating a venture ecosystem that is as diverse and reflects the city of LA. And so we really focus on um, Latinx um, innovators and investors. Um, and we've been doing that program. This will be our third year. And so we're definitely starting to see the seeds kind of sprout up. Our, you know, our outlook is seven to 10 years, um, but we are really confident about, you know, the, the work we're doing now that, that we'll see some fruit from it. Awesome. And so the one, the one thing I was going to add is just that we're working to aggregate resources and content for entrepreneurs into a single places so they can go to that have a list of all the grants that are open right now uh, that have education resources for founders that are free or low cost, uh, you know, just really looking to put all of that uh, in, in, you know, one place for them to go to uh, if possible. Uh, so for example, the Fearless Fund is running a program right now on, uh, you know, they, they, I think they have about 800 right now, 800 first time entrepreneurs that are enrolled in this year long program that will help them get ready for funding. And they're aggregating um, in a Facebook group, all this content that they can come back to and access over and over and over uh, that includes sources of grants and sources of, um, you know, very, very low cost loan programs that are the things that they'll need to keep going to get their minimum viable product together knowing that, that uh, they're not gonna be able to take on investors right now, nor should they, right? They're not ready. Uh, so how right. can we help them with that funding gap? Anybody else? So kind of a follow-up to, to, to what you guys were talking about, uh, you know, especially you Charlton, as far as, I've looked at some of your programs and on, on what you teach these kids and I'm, I, I'm kind of curious because I, I, I think about this all the time and, and trying to teach one of these kids or a young person to learn about entrepreneurship and get them to the next level. Um, what are you guys finding is the most valuable thing you're teaching them? Is it anything in particular? Um, so I think what we, what we focus on a lot is the relationship piece, the networking piece. It's the really 
how do you ask good questions um, of an of entrepreneurs? How do you pull out what you need to understand? Uh, but probably the the biggest thing, and you know, in line with that, we have we have raised a small fund, what, what we call our lab fund, which is kind of our teaching venture capital clinic, where we put the students in the seat of the investors and allow them to talk to entrepreneurs, um, get together an investment committee, you know, put together investment memos, and then kind of duke it out to say this is the entrepreneur that we want to back, um, and then provide non dilutive grants to those to those founders, and so when they get in the process of actually having some money to, to, you know, take a bet, that's when we see that they really internalize the curriculum. And we also get to invite those founders into our community. And so we have a portfolio of around 10, uh, 10 founders that we kind of take through our own little curriculum and connect them to, to the greater relationships. And so when they really get, you know, get the, some skin in the game, um, we, we find that's when they really, when it really clicks for them. I think that's interesting, Charlton, that you said that one of the first things you teach is the networking skills. Uh, we just hired a new principal, and that was actually top of the list. Um, having the finance skills is table stakes, and being able to do due diligence memo is table stakes. I mean, they got to be able to do it, but we've got 100 applicants that have those table stakes. And having the personal skills to be able to network your way to opportunities, to be able to build a bond with an entrepreneur, to develop relationships was the differentiating factor uh, with how we hired. So uh, it, it's great to hear uh, you know, your focus on, on both the hard skills and those uh, soft skills. It, it has to all come together. These jobs are so competitive that that's really uh, what I find is a differentiator. Mm -hmm. Exactly, we find that the students are in kind of that, the grade mentality they wanna, you know, Put in a put in a paper and get a grade for it, but a lot of it is those those soft skills, those loose skills, those connecting with someone, um, being able to build a network, and so it's great to hear that that's what you're looking at. I'd say uh, just from an investor perspective, it's just more about awareness. There's there's a lot of investors who just don't recognize or realize that. This, there's an alternative asset class out there that they could invest in. So education and awareness is really huge. And um, we, we partner with uh, the ION here in Houston, which is an innovation hub. Uh, and we provide monthly webinars around angel and early stage investing. And actually we're starting our first one for this year uh, will be tomorrow. And then we'll do one each month and we'll build on uh, the previous month's um, uh, session as well. So by the end, when, once you finish all 12, actually it'll be 11, once you finish all 11 sessions, you should understand a lot more about angel investing and you would be able to hear from a lot of guest speakers as well who can uh, speak in, um, in, in from, from a, a real perspective of their experience. So uh, I think, you know, just being aware uh, of this asset class and, and learning the, just the lingo as well is, is really important and could help kind of drive more investors into the ecosystem. You know, that's interesting you say that Lenny, when we were starting the jump fund back in 2012 and we knew we wanted to target high net worth ladies, right? Uh, to be LPs in our fund. We, the way we did it was we held coffee meetings with like, you know, eight to 10 uh, women that we knew in our networks. And we actually ran very sort of, you know, safe space kind of presentations where you could ask any question that you might think was dumb, but we educated them on terminology. And we talked about what it meant to invest in a startup and how was that different than, um, you know, having a financial advisor who put your money in a mutual fund or, you know, invest it in a stock and, you know, how would this work? And, you know, um, we talked about the types of companies we were expecting to see. And, you know, it was just amazing to just see sort of the light go on like, oh, I, you know, I had no idea you could find a startup and actually, you know, just put money in it. And, and what was the difference between you finding your own startup and, and putting, you know, as, as you guys were saying, 25 grand in your own um, individual startup versus, you know, putting 50 to $100,000 in our fund and having us spread the risk for you across all the companies we invest in in the fund. And, you know, just doing that education. And they were like, yeah, I'm in. 
And then, you know, the other thing was, is they all want to write us a check for $50,000 that day, right? And I was like, wait, no, you know, you give us, you know, 20% now, and then we'll call the capital as we need it. And uh, they were like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, well, that, that works too. Um, so it really was about that education, um, you know, because as we all know, um, women invest their money differently than men. They do a lot more homework, a lot more analysis, a lot more, wait, when, how will I get the money back? And when does the return come? And, and you know, and so we needed to create sort of those smaller education sessions to, it, to educate women on this asset class. But once that happened, it was, you know, it took us, you know, uh, a very short period of time to raise that first fund and, and to have it be mostly women and, uh, and get them on board. And then we just did the analysis and I think it was something like 60 to 70% of our LPs in fund one came over to fund two. And then we added even more um, from there. So uh, it, it really is take your time, explain this to new investors into this space because that's what we're gonna have to do to expand the diversity of, of our check writers and, and understand that they just don't know about um, you know investing in startups, but it doesn't mean that that um, people aren't willing to try something new and unique. We just have to give them a chance. Well, Kim, let me ask you. You're talking about um, uh, women investors being a little different than men. Do you, do you find that women typically invest in different types of deals than men? Well, you, you know, I think in general, angel investors invest differently than, you know, obviously venture capitalists, right? And angel investors tend to invest in things that they're personally passionate about or industries that they feel like they know something about or that they feel like they can share their expertise in, right? Um, you know, so it just depends on, you know, how active you want to be, right? And we have some LPs in the jump fund that want to be super active. So they, they want to help us with our due diligence. So we've invested in the jump fund, we've invested in some life sciences companies, for example, and some of our LPs are physicians. So when we uh, look at some of these life sciences companies, we will actually invite some of our LPs that are in healthcare to the pitch meetings. They come, they listen, they ask questions. Uh, we've also had like, so we invested in a cybersecurity company and we had somebody that had expertise in our LP base. They helped us with due diligence. Uh, we have a clean tech energy company and we were able to get one of our LPs who's in that space uh, to, to actually help with some supply chain questions that came up with one of our, with that company. So we have a pretty active LP base, which doesn't surprise us, um, you know, given, you know, that we have a, a lot of women who are uh, who wanted to actually stay involved and engage, like how can we help these companies? Can we make introductions? Many of them work in corporate America who are uh, potential clients of our startups. So they wanna make introductions, they wanna help with sales, you know, they, they wanna do what they can do. So, um, so we, we just keep everybody um, really informed. And you know, so that's, that's been interesting for us. And we also got some referrals of the companies we've invested in from our LPs. Uh, so they, they've referred startups to us and said, hey, take a look at this. Should we invest in this? So we love it. I mean, we love how engaged they've all been. And, and we certainly love the, the response rate when we, when we started Jump Fund 2 and the ones that wanted to come back in because we raised our minimum buy-in um, for Jump Fund 2 and um, you know, still had a pretty good track record of folks that came in and Jump Fund 2. So it definitely you know, was a, a good success for us to prove out our thesis that women would invest in startups and they would invest in other women. Well, let me ask a, a similar question kind of to, to everybody. Um, let's talk about the perspective of the investor. And I, I'm not kind of a callous question, but at the end of the day, you know, investors are looking for a rate of return, right? So when you're saying, hey, Mr. Investor, I'm going to take your, your money and put it in my fund and I'm going to invest, I'm going to focus on, I'm not focused on the world, I'm going to focus on women, I'm going to focus on minority-led founded companies. How do, how do you um, sell them on that? And that is, it's arguably limiting the pool of companies that they can, you can invest in. Well, I'll answer on the women question and I'll leave it uh, to the others to answer on, on um, the other one. But the data is very compelling on the question of women in that um, companies that have at least one woman in the C-suite are outperforming companies that do not. So the data, they've looked at the data on a, at least a five-year trend. Uh, there's a, um, I think it's a McKinsey study. There's a Babson College study. And the, the financial returns, I think, are at, at some point like 63% greater financial returns. So we tell people all the time, we are not a not-for-profit. We're here to make money. And investing in gender-diverse leadership teams produces greater financial return. 
So we do not, and we are not looking for all female led teams, just as we don't like all male led teams. We want gender diverse leadership teams. Uh, the other side I'll give you is that over 90% of every buy decision in every household is made by a woman. And when you look at a healthcare decision, it gets to close to 95% or greater of every healthcare decision is made by a woman. And if you're dealing with a household where there isn't a woman in the household, the man has typically got a woman in his life that he reaches out to, to help him with that decision. So, um, so if, you, if, if you do not um, have a woman on your uh, product team, on your go-to-market team, you are missing a key buyer in your strategy. So how do, you, how do you be successful if you don't have your buyer represented in your leadership team? So the financial return data is very clear on the gender issue. And I'm sure that uh, Charlton and Lenny probably have the same kind of stats for you know, um, race, uh, for diversity on race, but this is, there's a compelling financial business case here that, that um, is very clear to our investors and they understand it. Yeah, Bill, right, well, I, the, the, the secret to any investment strategy is to be focused where everybody else isn't. Right. If you had a strategy that looked like everybody else's, the best you could do is probably be at the mean. If you want to outperform, if you want, if you want alpha and you want to outperform the mean, you got to be looking where other people aren't. You got to be zigging when other people are zagging. So anytime I hear about a market that's underserved, undercapitalized, underrepresented, under, you know, underlooked at, uh, that usually is the first step into something we call opportunity. And I think that that uh, can be the, the focus for any investment strategy that's communicated to uh, investors or other supporters. And, and I would add that too to any entrepreneurs who are on this call. If you're going mm -hmm. after a market that is unsexy, uh, uh, under-recognized, um, you know, not on the radar of, of, of other places that isn't hot, I think you lead with that. I think that, that it sounds like the beginning of an opportunity that you're looking at something that other, everyone else is missing. And that's really how you uh, ultimately outperform. Yeah, what I would add is that there's also diversity within diversity, just like Kim was describing. There, there's no different difference than uh, having a portfolio of all white male founders, but yet you can find diversity within that. So if you're focused on women, if you're focused on uh, ethnic minorities or whatever it might be, there's still diversity that can be found within that strategy. So, um, you know, I, I don't think there's a, there's a disadvantage by focusing on those groups. And uh, I'm kind of familiar with the McKinsey study as well, Kim. Um, it might be a different study or a different report, but um, they found that diversity is a, a com competitive differentiator uh, that, that directly correlates to better financial performance. So the more diversity that you have within your leadership teams, and, and this goes for entrepreneurs as well, as, as, as you start to uh, find, uh, look for people to hire or people to, to join you as a co-founder, you want to uh, try to find uh, diverse representation and that will help, uh, I think, improve uh, your, your product, your service offering, and most importantly, understand the market that you're trying to serve. It could be bigger than what you actually think. Yeah, I'll just jump in um, and just piggyback on what everyone has been saying. Um, so I know Kaufman Fellows and Mac Venture Capital recently released a report um, that said that diverse um, founding teams outperformed by 30%. Um, and so, yeah, and so you go back to um, what Kim said, you just invest in the things that work, like keep investing in what will give you a bigger return until it tells you not to. Um, and so if your strategy is to, um, you know, return your fund and, and give your, and, you know, the LPs the, the best chance of returning um, and, and making a, a profit, then diverse founding teams, um, um, teams that have women, um, women founders, those are, those are the folks you should be investing in. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm starting to see that we're supposed to start some q and I'm not sure if I'm seeing them all, but here's one. Um, 
Lenny mentioned that minimum check size and impediment to smaller earlier companies. What's driving that? Are compliance costs too high to see formation off smaller scale PEVC funds? Um, I, I think there was a, maybe a misunderstanding in, in what I uh, talked about. So the, the minimum check size is an impediment to investors that want to participate in VC backed deals. So um, if, if you want to get um, access to a, a, one of the a, a VC funds, um, fund that they're, you know, where, where they're raising money for, you may have to come up with at least $250,000. And that's just, that's just one barrier. The other barrier is you probably have to know someone to get in because most of these deals that are VC backed are oversubscribed and th there's a lot of interest in them as well. So that's what I meant by uh, uh, minimum check size. And what we do is we meet the minimum of the VC fund by aggregating uh, a bunch of smaller investments. So the VC is getting one check and uh, they're dealing with one LP and we manage the, the burden of the smaller checks. So our uh, minimum investment is $10,000 plus fees. And, and I can add to that question as to what compliance costs are an impediment to the launching of smaller scale PE funds and VC funds. The answer is yes, it is. Um, so remember the economic model of VC is that they make money in two ways. They can earn management fees, which at a maximum are usually 2% uh, of invested capital per year. And they can earn carry, which only gets paid when they actually realize profits from their investments and they keep a percentage of the profit they make for their investors. So keeping that in mind, a $10 million fund could generate about $200,000 of fees, which you can use to run your business, to pay yourselves, pay your principals, pay your legal and accounting costs, to run the firm. And um, that's not a lot. And 10 million is a pretty large chunk of change and that's hardly enough to run the business. Now, $5 million, fund would only have $100,000 a year to run the business. And you can see, you can't really afford to hire more than one person and have an office for that amount of money. So um, it is certainly true that there are a lot of legal accounting uh, and compliance um, expenses. And there is sort of a minimum scale you have to have. Usually when, when we launch a fund, we want to see that it can have at least $10 million of capital to be self-supporting. And, uh, yeah. and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's just one of those challenges. There are some ways, I mean, the ultimate way to get around that is to not pay yourself. And I think a lot of us on this call started in the industry that way by working for free for some time uh, until we got to the scale where we could start paying ourselves. So believe it or not, your venture capital investor probably started out just like you did as an entrepreneur. We also have to raise capital right. from others. And we also have to make uh, sacrifices when we first start out. Well, let me ask you guys to look into the future. You know, we've kind of talked about the problems and what you guys are doing. Um, where do you see the industry going in the future and how is it going to change? Are there going to be any new mandates coming in to address these issues? For example, hey, our fund X percent is going to go to women, minorities, anything of that nature. Where do you, where do you see it going? I don't I've think seen some writers out there where a lot of funds are, are committing to diversity, uh, you know, by making a pledge or signing a writer, uh, so to speak, and they, they, they're going to include that in all of their funds going forward. Um, there's been some changes recently with the SEC regulations that I think will help a little bit, but there's, there's still a lot more that needs to be done. Um, uh, I also think that technology is going to impact the way we invest in the future as well. I mean, you see some of it now, um, but I, uh, for instance, we're launching a, a, a platform where you'll be able to do 50, Reg D 506C uh, transactions all digitally. So uh, I think that's going to give people more exposure to opportunities and give entrepreneurs more access to market their deals as well. Mm -hmm. the, the only thing I, the only thing that, um, I, I'm a little more pessimistic maybe than Lenny is, but because I, I feel like we've been hearing for years that 
that things were going to change in terms of VCs hiring more diverse talent. But what could help is COVID and sort of this remote work and um, and the you know the VCs on the coast getting more comfortable that their talent doesn't have to sit on the coast, which means yeah. they could hire people from different areas. You know, I, I don't know if you guys have been following this trend that apparently a bunch of VCs are now all moving down to Florida and uh, you know camping out in Miami all of a sudden. You know, Miami's the hot town, and uh, you know so you know, that could lead to a new pipeline of talent, right? Which, um, you know, could lead to picking up, uh, you know, uh, more women, more people of color into some of these VCs that um, have historically been white men, uh, you know, so that, that could give us some hope because I, I do think we've got to focus on changing the trajectory of people writing the checks in order to make a difference on the, the pipeline of, um, of, of uh, companies. Uh, so, you know, that's something that could potentially give us some hope. Well, I, and I can tell everyone I work with probably hundreds of VCs and I don't know anybody that isn't looking for more deal flow from women leaders and minority leaders. Um, I think that if we stay focused on the early stage pipeline and continue to develop companies that meet the economic metrics, you're going to find a lot of very excited and very interesting, interested later stage VCs on the other side. It's just that mm -hmm. that early stage is the problem. It's getting less of a share of the funding. Uh, more of the funding is going later stage. Uh, it is the part that is more focused local, more focused with diversity. And so if we can continue to do our work on the early stage, you know, I, I am confident that the, the middle and later stage VCs are gonna have uh, very open arms. Uh, I know that's the case now. When we're going through deal flow and we're talking to other firms, everybody's asking, you know, do you have anything from diverse founders? Uh, oh, and plus it's women led. I mean, it's always the bonus, right? It's always, that's the extra twist that, that people will take a pitch when they otherwise wouldn't. So the opportunity's there. We just need to develop uh, the, the entrepreneurial deal flow. And, and as everybody knows, I think uh, Lenny said it, you know, it's gonna be one out of 10 that's gonna continue to move down that line uh, I promise there are open arms. And I would add what Kim said right off the bat, and that is that VC is not the end-all be-all. Um, earned revenue from uh, your actual customers is going to give you options. Companies that earn a lot of revenue from customers will have VC options. And the nice thing is that they probably won't need it. Um, and on that line, I will say, don't do free pilots. So yeah. hello, everybody out there. Say, just say no to free pilots. What you yeah, yeah. Why, why is that, Cliff? If you, find the right client, if you find the right customers, they will pay for what you do, even if it requires a little bit of development on your side to get them what they want. But the companies that I see that have gotten the most traction the quickest said no to free pilots. No. Nope. Great, great advice. We got about two more minutes, and I would love for you guys to jump into, you know, dig deep. Tell these entrepreneurs what other advice to give them. Hmm. Oh, um, I'll tell you, do your homework on any investor before you approach them. Make sure you understand what their investment thesis is, what stage of investing they do, look at whom else they've invested in uh, to see if, if your company is a fit. Uh, you know, um, and, and, um, and I think, uh, I think it was Charlton that mentioned, you know, networking and he was talking about invest, you know, investors learning networking skills, but entrepreneurs need to learn networking skills too, because I don't know if any of us on this a panel have ever written a check into somebody that we didn't get to know first, that didn't network with us first. We get to know you, we want to get to know you. So do your homework and, and learn how to network with us too. Mm -hmm. I, I, absolutely. And I would add, Get advice before accepting capital on those early stage rounds. Those early stage angel investors, even those friends and family rounds, be sure to get good advice. Get a referral from Nexus Louisiana, get a referral from Jump. I mean, whoever you know, I'm sure anyone on this call would be happy to give you advice, but I've seen some really good people inadvertently ruin their company because they took a little bit of capital at the wrong terms using unprofessional deal structure, giving controls that are not standard for that stage of company. Um, often, uh, believe it or not, raising a little bit of money at too high a valuation 
entrepreneurs who actually are so successful at raising money at a very high valuation can actually hurt their ability to raise capital in the next round because that professional investor that's more discriminating against about price doesn't want to come in at a down round and they'll just pass rather than come at a down. down. Get advice to make sure that your deal terms are standard, your pricing is, is, is set to, to industry norms, and that you're not setting yourself up as being funky or weird or being a company that needs to be fixed before a professional investor can come in. I agree with that. I agree with that. Try, try to keep it simple, um, especially hey, in your early stage. Hey guys, I'm gonna- hey, Wendy, cut this off. I know, I'm gonna cut you off. Y'all, this has been a fantastic discussion. Thank you to all of you. I'm so glad to have, to have you here. Um, we do have to move on to our next session. So next up is our final keynote, Philip Rosedale. So for those of you that are watching, um, you'll be exiting this session and head on, head oning. Wow, it's been a long day. <laughs> Heading on to our next session. But thank you to all of our panelists. And, um, and I hope that, uh, that, you, that you guys have gotten something out of today. So thanks a lot and see you at our next session. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks great.